Uh, it was a, a sort of physical thing. And look to the future when Charles eventually inherits his mother's crown. He has been brilliant in waiting. Because, my God, has been a long time in waiting. Queen Elizabeth II is the ultimate matriarch. At 93, she's Britain's longest-serving monarch. As a young woman, she pledged her life to one of service and duty. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. Today, she is one of the most powerful and respected world leaders. So how has the Queen managed to adapt to the changing decades? And what qualities will Charles need to make the crown his own? The Queen's discretion, I think, is her secret weapon. She very, very, very seldom puts her foot wrong. I don't think she would ever, ever pull herself up to her full height. She's just not that sort of woman. And that, I think, is one of her secrets, actually. Poise, dignity, gravitas, immense stamina. It is a 24-7 job. It's not one of those jobs that you can say, oh, I'm not going to work today. My lords and members of the House of Commons. As head of state, much of the Queen's work requires a serious, steadfast approach. The Queen works every single day of the year. Uh, and when I say work, it, it, they are her red boxes. Red boxes have government papers. And she doesn't get these boxes once a day. She sometimes gets them three times a day. Yet those that know her reveal she has a much more mischievous side. <laughs> she's a wonderful mimic, and she can take all accents and things, uh, and uh, she's got a very good eye. I mean, she'll notice somebody, and she will, you know, after they've left or gone, uh, she'll take them off. Every year, the Queen goes into the toy shop at Beaumont and buys a number of small toys for the children. And while she was in the shop, this American lady said to her, gee, honey, you look just like the Queen. And the Queen said, how reassuring. Royal photographer Ken Lennox has photographed the Queen for over half a century. He's seen how the Queen's dry sense of humor has carried her through some tricky situations. It's the Queen talking to a shepherd, which she did once a year, and he would relay to her how the flock had gone that year, and he would address her in a very, very thick Aberdeenshire accent. It actually has a name for the language called the Doric, and the Queen is laughing because she can't understand a word that he was saying to her. Central to the Queen is her sense of duty and service. And as guardian of nearly a thousand years of British royal history, she knows the power that legacy wields. The magic of castles, carriages and crowns is enough to seduce any world leader. She's met pretty much anyone and everyone of substance uh, from the middle part of the 20th century onwards. She is absolutely part of an international landscape in a way that no other world leader is. She recognizes, I think, that she is not famous because of who she is, but it's because of what she is. She knows all these world leaders are coming to meet the monarch. Therefore, she is able to be utterly, utterly professional. That professionalism was tested during Donald Trump's first visit to the UK as president in July 2018. Either he's been very badly briefed or he's forgotten. Uh, so that when he meets the Queen, he doesn't bow as he should have done. And then when they're walking together, he walks in front of her. 
nobody walks in front of the Queen. And yet the Queen seems completely unmoved by all of this and just sort of shoots him on a bit. <laughs> Despite the protocol faux pas, the Queen got on with doing what she does best. They'd only allotted 20 minutes in the diary for this meeting. In fact, it overran by twice that length. It was a huge success by all accounts. She's always going to be the most important person in a room, but she doesn't have a sense of importance. One of her favourite jokes is if a if phone goes off, she says, oh, that must be somebody very important. <laughs> so, so although she has a great sense of herself and, you know, she is the Queen, but she's still Lilibet. Lilibet Windsor was thrust onto the world stage with the sudden death of her father on February the 6th, 1952. A year later, she was crowned queen aged just 27. Despite being in the grip of post-war austerity, this was Britain's chance to put on a show. Britain, in the early 50s, um, there is still rationing, it's drab, it's poor, people stand in queues, women wear headscarves. Prime Minister Winston Churchill famously said, you can't have coronations while there are bailiffs in the house. So Britain had to look great. This couldn't go wrong. There was so much riding on it. It was a huge feat of uh, organization with 29 bands and 13,000 soldiers. There was a feeling that Britain now had to re-establish itself after war, after austerity, after the end of empire. And royal ceremonial is the best way of waving the flag for brand Britain. A huge wave of cheering travels with her, pouring along the mall as those would lift her and carry her on her way. On June the 2nd, 1953, up to three million lined the streets of London to witness the arrival of the new Elizabethan age. Waiting at the Abbey was 20-year-old Lady Anne Cook, today Lady Glen Connor. I remember standing at the door and suddenly we heard the roar and we knew she's coming and the roar got louder and louder and louder. And then round the corner came this golden coach. The colour and the music I mean, it was like a sort of Disney film. I mean, absolutely unreal. Lady Anne had been handpicked to be one of the Queen's six maids of honour. We all had to be daughters of earls, marquises or dukes. And we were treated, uh, it was rather fanciful perhaps to say this, like a girl band. one, almost touching. Lady Mary Bailey Hamilton was just 19. Today at 85, she's rarely spoken in public about her role as a maid of honor. I got the best place, because I was the smallest. And she looked so young, and one thought, gosh, she's got so much responsibility. The maids, too, felt a great sense of duty. Nothing could go wrong to spoil the Queen's big day. Just in case any of them felt faint, they were issued with a bottle of smelling salts. I had my file of uh, smelling salts in there. Not that they did much good. I started to sway. I just, you know, I couldn't see it. Everything was black. I mean, it was awful thought, oh my God, I cannot let the Queen down. I mean, I could ruin the whole thing. All the cameras, millions of people all over the world were watching it. Fortunately, one of the Queen's personal ushers, Black Rod, saw what was happening. 
suddenly I had this wonderful arm pinning me to the pillow at the back. Uh, he didn't luckily use his rod, but he used his arm. And he kept me, and it was just long enough for me to recover. Oh, here comes the great moment. I may say that crown weighs a ton. <laughs> We all thought we were part of history. The noise, the love, uh, it was a, a sort of physical thing. It more or less sort of hit you, you could feel it. This is the most marvelous thing I've ever done in my life. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? I was there. Uh, Extraordinary feeling. 300 million people around the world watched this thing. It was a, a, a moment when the nation really did come together. It was a real phenomenon. Really, very few people now have a personal memory of it. But it stands on the horizon of the past a sort of glowing moment in our history. Since the coronation, the diminutive queen has emerged as a giant on the world stage. She has met almost every world leader in the past 67 years, although not all were warmly welcomed. For the first and only time in her life, she actually hides in a bush in the palace garden to avoid her own guests. For more than six decades, a huge part of the Queen's success has been her visibility. Ever since the spectacle of the coronation, she's gone to extraordinary lengths to be seen. Not only in Britain, but around the world. The Queen's job is terribly easy and impossibly difficult. She has to smile and wave, and she's pretty good at doing that. But she also has to... Uh, relate to her subject. She can't just be the gloved hand in the gold coach. She has to be seen, as she says, to be believed. She knows that people have come to see her. She knows how important that is. She recognizes that there's something that is a big deal in people's lives, something that they will talk to their children and their grandchildren about the day they met the Queen. I remember in Kingston, Jamaica, um, the Queen was determined to do a walkabout. She said, I'm Queen of Jamaica, I will go to downtown Kingston. So she began this walkabout, and the ladies are saying, nice, 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 and they're putting their arms around her. I'm afraid the bodyguards practically lifted her up and threw her into the back of the Land Rover. But she wanted to be seen, and she wanted to meet the ordinary people. Wesley Kerr was royal correspondent throughout the 90s. He regularly accompanied the Queen on overseas visits. She knew that my father was in Jamaica, so she said, did you see your father, Mr Kerr? And I said, yes, yes, he came down and he was, and he was, and he said, did he see me? She wanted to know that the work that she was doing was having a reaction. One of the Queen's secrets is her trademark block colour outfits. At a little over five feet, she's learned how to stand out in a crowd. Once upon a time, monarchs were very identifiable because they were wearing crowns and they had jewels and, and they were sitting on thrones. That is no longer the case. People are going to queue up behind barriers and wait for hours for a glimpse of their monarch. Then she's got to be looking the part. And uh, the Queen looking very bright and summery, in turquoise and yellow. Where clothes are concerned, it, it matters terribly to her. Uh, Margaret Thatcher made an extraordinary overture to her when she became Prime Minister. She asked her whether she should consult the Queen about uh, their dresses not clashing. And um, 
she got a very chilly note back from the palace saying, the queen does not notice what other people are wearing. She's got to stand out. That's why she does wear primary colours. That's why you, you will see the hat in a crowd of thousands, and that's for a very good reason. As she once said to one of her dresses, I can't wear beige because no one will know who I am. The queen's eye for making a statement goes right back to her coronation. Her dress, which took eight months to create, was embroidered with flowers from both Britain and the Commonwealth in gold and silver thread. She looked incredible. It was a most beautiful dress, heavily embroidered um, with all the symbols of the rose, the daffodil. The maids, too, each had dresses which were equally ornate. Brings back memories, does it? Certainly does. I couldn't get into them now. <laughs> the point was that they are uh, tremendously embroidered down the back because people were, were seen from the back a lot. But it, as you can see, it wasn't lined. And here you can see where the embroidery is extremely uh, prickly. But um, we were so proud of them. Throughout the months of preparations, every effort was made to keep their dresses a secret. The last rehearsal, we were told to wear our dresses. Um, they said, wear a shawl, you know, to hide it. Well, when we left the Abbey, there was quite a wind, and my shawl got whished away. And to my horror the next day, front page, she didn't know it was a secret. And I thought, oh, help, how awful. Uh, um, the Duke of Norfolk was bound to ring me up now and say, look, I'm terribly sorry, Anne, but you can't take part. <laughs> it is a piece of history. Lady Mary has also kept her precious dress. Well, what I think is lovely is that I can show it to my children and grandchildren. I haven't got any great-grandchildren yet, but hopefully, I will have soon, and they will think, goodness me, what's that? Because it was very beautiful. This dress is on stamps, it's on coin, it, you know, everywhere. You turn on the television quite often as a picture of the Queen at, the, at her coronation with us behind carrying the trade. It's an iconic dress, isn't it? Nearly 70 years later, the coronation still stands as the finest example of British royal pomp and pageantry. As a young queen, Elizabeth was quick to learn the power of perfectly executed royal ceremony. It doesn't matter who you are as a head of state, it's still a very big deal to be invited by Queen Elizabeth II to be part of the great British royal pageantry, to be in a carriage with her, to be the guest of honour at a state banquet. It's one of the great tools, if you like, in the British diplomatic armoury. The Queen pays the most extraordinary attention to detail. She cares passionately about um, the, the, the accommodation that visiting heads of state will have. She will inspect the rooms herself. She will choose what books should go by their bedside. When she gives a banquet, she will inspect the table and everything is done with a tape measure. She is a very, very accomplished hostess. While it is the Queen's job to wine and dine, it's not her job to choose her guests. That's the preserve of the government of the day. And occasionally, the guest list has caused considerable panic at the palace. Every now and then over the years, I'm afraid the government has invited one or two shockers. President Mobutu of Zaire was definitely a low point, particularly when his wife smuggled her pet dog through customs. The Queen was very unhappy about that. But there was another state visitor who was even worse than the Mobutus. Five years later, arrived 
from Romania, Nikolai and Elena Ceausescu. The Nadir in the Royal Visitor's Book. Nikolai Ceausescu ruled communist Romania with an iron grip for nearly 25 years. Yet despite his despotic reputation, by the mid-1970s, he was willing to stand up to the Soviet bloc. The government think maybe this is a man we could do business with behind the Iron Curtain. He may be ghastly. In fact, we know he's ghastly, but let's get him here nonetheless. At the National Archives, Daily Mail journalist Robert Hardman has unearthed a stack of documents which reveal the worry that Ceausescu's visit caused. The press have started to question the Foreign Secretary, David Owen, and say, why are we inviting this monster to come to Britain? Uh, and here is a background briefing sent from David Owen's private secretary to the Foreign Secretary, and this is an extraordinary handwritten note at the top. Who did agree to this visit, writes David Owen. Did I? If I did, I regret it. Do you remember writing that sentence? Well, I, I've read it. I certainly, uh, absolutely, I think the answer is that, you know, at various stages, you can technically stop it. But, I mean, it's purely technical. I mean, the, the repercussions of blocking that visit would have been huge. Uh, somebody asked me why I didn't mention it in my memoirs. I said, I'm trying to forget that it ever happened. Years later, it emerged just how much the Queen had disliked her guests. So much so that while walking in the gardens at Buckingham Palace, she made a very unregal quick exit. She once told a lunch guest, who in turn told me of the occasion when they were staying, and she took the corgis out for a walk in the palace garden, and she could see the Ceausescu's coming the other way. And thinks, I can't, really can't face talking to them. So for the first and only time in her life, she actually hides in a bush in the palace garden to avoid her own guests. The Queen puts up with uh, having many different people, but Ceausescu was too much for her. <laughs> she, she made it quite, quite plain. <laughs> she didn't like that visit. Years afterwards, she would still refer to Ceausescu as that frightful little man. Despite the awkwardness of Ceausescu's visit, the Queen's decades of experience carried her through. But occasionally, some of her guests have tried to get a little too familiar. President Reagan put his hand in the Queen's lower back to escort her to the ranch. I <laughs> couldn't believe it. With the Queen's record-breaking reign spanning nearly seven decades, she has been a constant in an ever-changing political landscape. From the Suez Crisis to the miners' strike, 9-11 to Brexit, the Queen has seen it all. She has got more political experience than anybody else in the world. She's had the red boxes delivered to her ever since 19, the 1950s, and so she knows exactly what's going on. For the Queen, her vast experience affords her great power. As such, she can humble even the most formidable of political beasts. In 1969, US President Richard Nixon came to tea at Buckingham Palace. Nixon, a really shrewd politician, extremely hard-nosed, and yet he comes to Buckingham Palace and his knees turn to jelly. It's a most extraordinary thing. I think it's to do with the ineffable prestige of a monarchy that goes back to, you name it, William the Conqueror, Ethelred the Unready. Um, and I think somebody like Nixon realizes that he's touching the hem of history, really. It's, it's magic. During her reign, the Queen has met 11 sitting US presidents. Always welcoming, she has played a large part in developing the so-called special relationship. Yet few got as close as the flamboyant actor-turned-president, Ronald Reagan. Ronnie Reagan come out and he's got cowboy boots on and he stuck his heel into the gravel and scraped a line for us to stand on. 
Ken Lennox was waiting at the Reagan's Californian ranch, just as the president got a little too familiar with the British monarch. The queen arrives by car, she gets out, president greets her, and they turn to do a photograph. Snap, snap, snap. And they turn to go away, and President Reagan <laughs> put his hand in the Queen's lower back. <laughs> we all <laughs> couldn't believe it. Reagan isn't the only US president to break the royal rules. In 2009, Michelle Obama caused a stir when she put her arm around the Queen and President Carter raised a few royal eyebrows when he got rather intimate with the Queen Mother. Jimmy Carter kissing the Queen Mother on the lips and she taking an abrupt step back and saying that, gee, well, no one had done that since her husband died. It's not just over the pond that the Queen works her magic. From day one in the job, she pledged her commitment to the new Commonwealth. Unlike the empire, which ultimately depended on, on, on force, um, the um, Commonwealth is entirely a matter of soft power, much of which is forged by the Queen. She took it on when it was just eight members. It's grown to 53. Many people predicted it was going to fall apart. The fact that it didn't is down to Queen Elizabeth II. As a young black person growing up here in, in, in the 60s and 70s, the only major public figure you would see, as it were, with, with, with black leaders as, as an equal, you know, dancing with Kenneth Cowan or greeting Mandela, or, you know, it, it was the Queen. She makes no distinction between people of different races. The Queen has realised that she must stick up for the nations of the Commonwealth, many of which were Republican. They weren't, they weren't even monarchists, but, but she's the head of the Commonwealth, and this has been a major achievement in her reign. I feel enormously proud of what the Commonwealth has achieved, and all of it within my lifetime. Prince Philip calls her the psychotherapist of the Commonwealth, that she's, she knows all the leaders, she hears their problems, and they see her as a kind of mother figure. Mother, wife, Queen. The job requires Elizabeth to play them all, and much more besides. Yet despite being the most famous face on earth, being monarch can be an isolating job. You are guardian of a whole heap of secrets you can't even share with your, with your husband. You spend a lot of time with strangers. You are expected to know exactly why you're somewhere, why the people you're speaking to are, are there. I think it's a very lonely job, a very lonely job. But the Queen has a secret weapon, or as she put it, her strength and stay. Prince Philip, her dashing naval officer whom she married in 1947, has stood beside, or more accurately behind her, for over 70 years. Is not the kind of man you'd expect to follow a few footsteps behind someone else. Very forthright, but he attended to the Queen. He represented her. He did everything that he could to help, and, and uh, he calls her cabbage, for goodness sake. Can you imagine calling Queen cabbage? Ken Lennox was on the wrong end of Prince Philip's forthright approach when he tried to photograph him twice in one day. He spotted me out the side of his eye, turned his head round, marched over to me and said, has my face changed so bloody much in four hours that you need to re-photograph it? I just stood there <laughs> petrified. Yet despite Philip's brusque nature, when called upon to do his duty, he was the first in line to swear his allegiance to his new queen. Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, who with his hands between the hands of the queen becomes her liege man of life and limb. This is the moment where he is subordinating himself and his role to supporting the queen. He is dedicating his life not just to her as husband, 
but as defender, as her number one, if you like. The Duke of Edinburgh, I think, wanted to make the coronation wonderful for the Queen, looking after, but he was a bit fussy. We had been trained absolutely by the Duke of Norfolk. We knew exactly what to do. But I remember him coming out, think, ah, you better lift that up or do something, you know. Uh, and he wanted, I think, to be part of it, you know. And uh, it was secretly, one was sort of thinking, oh, do wish he'd go away, you know. <laughs> we know what to do. After the coronation, the Queen and Prince Philip undertook a marathon six-month tour of the fledgling Commonwealth, becoming the first ruling British monarch to set foot in Australia and New Zealand. Her arrival sent the locals into a frenzy of patriotic fervour. This is the first time that I have spoken to New Zealanders in their own homeland. There was something almost medieval about that coronation tour. People were completely carried away. There was one town where they'd made a very special red carpet for the Queen to walk along, and after she left, no one could agree what should happen to it, so they cut it up into tiny pieces, and everyone in the town got a tiny piece of the carpet as a souvenir. In another town, everyone wanted a piece of the royal loo paper in the hotel that had been set aside for the uh, royal rest stop. Um, and uh, so each person who queued up, and they queued for a very long time, was each handed one sheet of loo paper. Everyone's always pleased to see the Queen, but that country, they pulled out so many of the stops. Some sheep farmers even dyed their sheep red, white and blue. Since the coronation, the Queen has visited well over a hundred countries. Today, she is the world's most traveled monarch. To an outsider, it might look like a dream job, but those in the know tell a different story. The royal tours are so organized, you wouldn't believe it. And it's minute by minute. I'm not exaggerating. 9.46, the Queen will arrive to open a new station. 9.49, the Queen will meet the Lord Mayor of such and such. 9.53, the Queen will get into the Royal Land Rover. 9.57, she'll arrive at the park. She will stay at the park for approximately nine minutes and will receive a bouquet and so on and so on. It's minute by minute. It's hard work, it's relentless work. I remember in three weeks in the Caribbean, she never seemed to sweat, or, or uh, I think perspire would be the word, <laughs> or glow, perhaps. She never glowed, never seemed exhausted. With so many people to meet and greet, Sticking to the programme is essential. And while the Queen has learned to take her timetable seriously, there have been other royals who haven't always played by the rules. It's very important in these circumstances you do not panic. Linda Chalker was Minister of State for Africa and Overseas Development between 1989 and 1997. She organised several royal tours including a trip to Nepal where Princess Diana went missing in action. One evening, uh, when we had gone to bed, there was a knock, knock, knock on the front door. Did I know where the princess was? I said, what? She decided, having been invited by the Crown Prince, to go out in his motor sports car, to go out with him, he had the roads closed off, and they had a little trip round the roads of Kathmandu. When the errant princess returned, she was unscathed but unrepentant. I said, um, that was a bit risky, ma'am, wasn't it? It was all right, she said. It was fun. It's important never to panic if you can avoid it. Now age 93, the Queen has more than done her duty for the nation. But what does the future hold for the Crown? We're not anything like prepared. Impossible act to follow. Castles, crowns and corgis 
Holding the top job comes with an array of perks. But for the Queen, none of them meant as much as her beloved royal yacht. Dating back to the restoration of the monarchy with Charles II, there have been a succession of royal yachts. And on the 16th of April, 1953, a crowd of over 30,000 braved the heavy rain to watch the Queen launch number 83. I name the ship Britannia. Sleek and elegant Britannia, hark back to an era of great British maritime power. Britannia had an amazing serenity, rather like a small version of those old Cunard liners. And the Queen and the Duke particularly loved it because it was the only one of their many homes that they themselves had chosen the furniture for. The royal drawing room, like many rooms on Britannia, has several pieces of furniture from the Victoria and Albert. It has duck egg blue walls and a hyacinth blue carpet. Britannia really was a genuine home for the royal family. It could give them freedom a sense of not having to worry who was looking around the corner. The Queen put it to, to her crew. She used to say, it's, it's the one place where I can be myself. It was a very important part of all their lives. In her 44 years of service, Britannia would carry members of the royal family on nearly a 1,000 trips all over the world. For me, from the household perspective, Britannia was a very welcome floating office. You know, you could catch up on your paperwork, you could, you could make phone calls, you could get your laundry done, you could, you could regroup. Really was a little piece of Britain coming into the harbour. Lots of business deals were done on that ship, lots of receptions were hosted. It was a fantastic place for her to relax, but it was also a brilliant, brilliant example of British soft power. Everybody wanted an invitation aboard. So if Britannia stopped in your country where you were the British ambassador and you were able to ask people for a drink on Britannia, everybody would turn up. I remember President Yeltsin came and showed a huge reluctance to leave. He thoroughly enjoyed his dinner and I think quite a lot of the wines as well. Um, and would have gladly, I think, sailed with us to Finland if he'd had half a chance. <laughs> Former Foreign Secretary David Owen also remembers Britannia's power to woo. In 1979, he was on board during a tour of the Gulf when the Queen hosted a dinner for King Khalid of Saudi Arabia. It was a terrific evening. He thoroughly enjoyed himself. You could absolutely see this. And when it eventually came for him to go, I mean, it was quite late. <laughs> and then we suddenly saw a walking stick where he's waving it. And as he went away, he saw 100 yards, 200 yards, 1,000 yards. <laughs> and he was still waving his stick. And he had the time of his life. So there's no doubt about it that it gave the monarch's visit something very special. After four decades and over a million nautical miles, the aging yacht was proving too expensive to run. So on December the 11th, 1997, at Portsmouth, Britannia was decommissioned. It was a freezing cold day. We were all on the quayside, and there were several thousand former crew members and their families there, as well as the royal family. We were all in tears. It was the greatest vessel in the world. William Evans spent six months crewing on the yacht before becoming Lord Louis Mountbatten's valet. All the royal family were at the end in the marquee, the whole lot, everybody was there. Everybody had tears in their eyes. The Queen was streaming with tears. I knew she was upset. She wouldn't show it if she could help it, but she had a tear. She loved it, you see, the freedom. Britannia's decommissioning signaled the end of an era. 
At 93, the queen has ruled longer than any other monarch in our history. But unavoidably, there will one day be a change of reign. I fear that we're not anything like prepared for the end of, of the present queen's reign. So whatever follows is inevitably going to be a bit of an anticlimax. Oh, dig that crazy rhythm. <laughs> crazy, you insane. Right. I think... Prince Charles will be king, and he will be the best prepared monarch that this country has ever had. Charles has spent much of his tenure as Prince of Wales being outspoken on a range of issues from homeopathy and politics to the environment and architecture. What is proposed seems to me like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much loved and elegant friend. He's written his spidery letters to ministers asking the sort of questions that we would want answers to. But he won't be able to do that when he becomes king because constitutionally, he'll have to keep his mouth shut. Diana very famously said, I don't think he should be king. Charles has too many servants, spends too much money, whereas the Queen has always been frugal. I mean, stories about Charles's bed being taken to a house that he's going to spend the weekend in and stuff like that. He denies some of them, but everyone involved says, yes, he does. Charles's personal life, too, has often dominated the headlines. He's got a lot of uncomfortable baggage that the Queen never had. She emerged absolutely pristine uh, onto the throne. He has had a very rackety past. He could do the crucial thing which a monarch shouldn't do, which is to divide opinion rather than unite it. But in recent years, Charles's image has undergone a transformation. Now happily remarried, today he seems to be enjoying life. I think the nation has changed in its attitude towards Charles. Years ago, we wrote him off as a nutter who talked to his plants, that today he is in a really good place. He has once again got back his joie de vivre. Aha, uh -huh. there'll be snow. He laughs again, he, he jokes, he's relaxed. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, and I think that makes him a much better prince and a much better father and a much better man all round. <laughs> you take someone like the Prince's Trust, which he started with the contents of his Royal Navy pension in the 70s, and it's become now the largest charitable network in this country. He's used his position to make a serious, tangible difference to the lives of a lot of his future subjects. He is a man who is utterly, utterly dedicated to hard work. He has been brilliant in waiting, because, my God, that's been a long time in waiting. Despite Charles's preparedness, he still might have a while to wait yet. I mean, the Queen Mother lived a good old age, and I think the Queen will too. I mean, she's very, very fit. I mean, she's riding. I mean, I saw her riding the other day. Years ago, I remember um, one of her private secretaries telling her that Queen Juliana of the Netherlands had abdicated. And the Queen just looked at her and said, typically Dutch. <laughs> I, there's, there is no question the Queen will abdicate. Queen Elizabeth's record-breaking reign has spanned nearly seven decades of extraordinary economic technological and political change. In that time, she has had to balance love with duty. You're not just marrying a person, uh, you're marrying a job. Seen fairy tale marriages become the stuff of nightmares. We were living a lie. We were covering up for the fact that the marriage was dead. Watch her family become embroiled in scandal and gossip. Princess Margaret was so much younger than him, and people were very shocked. 
They felt he'd taken advantage. And suffered great personal tragedy and loss. The flames seemed to be 200 feet high. You could see it in her face. The emotion was palpable. Yet through it all, Queen Elizabeth II has remained resolute. So much so that whilst around the world other monarchies have fallen, the British crown has not only survived, but thrived. Today, the future of the House of Windsor seems assured. It is an institution that works really well for this country because it is set apart from the grubby business of politics. As King Farouk of Egypt said shortly before his own throne uh, went south, very soon there'll only be five kings left, the kings of hearts, spades, diamonds, clubs, and the king of England. Thank you.